Bam. <laughs> Sapling. Hey. What up? You guys, you guys have quite a buzz going because when I put a couple of teasers up that you guys were coming on the show, all these people wrote me, including Todd Phillips. Do you know Todd Phillips? I do mm. know that name, but why? But he's a drummer. He was in one of my favorite bands, Bullet La Volta. And he also plays with the Juliana Hatfield Three, and oh, they're going right. on tour this summer. Nice. And he he saw the the photo of you guys, and he wrote me because he's been on the show before, and he's a really good guy. He loves you guys. Oh, cool! Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, you I get... definitely do. I I feel bad because I definitely know that name, and I I'm sure we've like interacted at some point. But my brain is like, mm -hmm. we just yeah, you, you guys have a fan base. Mm -hmm. I'm so, usually but... lucky if I remember my own name. So. <laughs> It's the paint water. I do. I like saying your name. Your name's good. So Amber, guitar, vocals, theremin. I added something to you, art director, because you're the art director, right, of the band, pretty much the art director. Oh, um, <laughs> well, I by that you mean like I smear paint on people occasionally. Then yeah, <laughs> you do. <laughs> you do. Yeah, and we all we all collaborate on the uh, art stuff for the albums. Like I did the artwork on our first album, No Sequoia and Rainy and I did uh, the more Farty, Farty, <laughs> mm -hmm. Farty artwork together. So we all, we all do art stuff, you know. <laughs> it's good to hear you na muff the name up a little because you guys have a lot of names <laughs> as you go along, songs, mm -hmm. album titles. And I have trouble seeing them all, but I'm going to, I'm going to do my best here. So um, you guys are all from central mass and you, you, even though you're not called a Worcester band, cause I know now that you actually played your first gigs in, in Boston. You didn't play your, with John, you played your, first, Oh, actually you said you did a babes in Toyland. Yeah. The babes in Toyland set in 2016 was the first show we played um, just to kind of get our feet wet with like different instrumentation. So I was playing drums and our current drummer then Dave was on bass, but we didn't do, we had a sapling show as sapling in like Western central mass in Southbridge in April of 2017. And John's actually, John's not from central mass. He's from right. the Boston area. Well, yeah. So I was living in Boston for a long time. I'm from Whitman originally. So I like the South shore. <laughs> Okay. I do remember that. I yeah, do. Yeah. I do remember that, that because we talked about that. Blame mm -hmm. it on Whitman. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, well, now you know when when you I asked you last, you know, when we spoke before about some of your influences, and both of you said that you know dad music was popular around the house. <laughs> Although Rainy did mention uh, Nirvana and the Foo Fighters and bands like that. Well, when, when did you? I know you had a drummer before, John, but when did you start getting into the more noisier stuff? Like we, you mentioned, ba we've talked about Babes already, because a lot of your stuff kind of reminds me of the of a Babes influence. I'm not mad about that. I'm mm -hmm. not mad. I like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know what Amber would say about this, but like to me, I think that we were kind of always attempting to do noisy stuff, but I don't think we were quite um, outfitted for it in the same way, like um you know the theremin we didn't have right off the bat the theremin kind of came in a little bit later i was not like an effects user really i probably had like one or two little pedals but like i really started working up my repertoire of noises once amber started getting bigger and it was just this sort of like relay race of adding stuff and then john is definitely like just in general a louder person than our our old drummer was like a big guy, so mm -hmm. he was like technically like a harder hitter at first because mm -hmm. John was still newer to drums, although right. now he's like getting a lot louder. Yeah, good job. I'm like, good job, thank John. you. <laughs> um, but just musically and influence wise, John was much more interested in like taking it up a notch. I, think. I just played drums with resistance bands. Yeah. And, yeah. And, then, and so I got stronger. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you're a drummer also, uh, Randy, too, right? Yeah, drums are my first instrument. So um, I. I think it probably took me not, not even when sapling started, but a couple of years into sapling before I honestly felt like, okay, I am also a bassist. Like for a little while in my last band where I did play bass, I was just kind of like, I don't know, I'm playing bass, I guess, but I don't really feel like I'm comfortable with this instrument yet. And now I'm like, all right, I play both. And I'm primarily a guitar player. So. Yeah. I was going to talk about that. I watched a video of you guys uh, recently at Ralph's and you, you, you ended up on guitar. 
Mm-hmm. And really yeah, that's a fun little trick we do sometimes. <laughs> drums. And uh, Amber ended up with a paintbrush and out in the audience. Well, not even a brush, really. Mm-hmm. That was wild. Um, I know that you played in a band called Rotating Strawberry Madonna, and Amber was bartending, and John's from Whitman. And mm-hmm. then you guys played together in service. Correct. Rainy and John. Mm-hmm. And how right. far before sapling was that i think that i think rainy joined service around 2016 something like that yeah. uh because we were playing and we uh needed a new drummer um and it just worked out uh i was the rainy replacement was a drummer, drummer in his band, and then he was the replacement drummer in my band too. yeah <laughs> so you guys were intertwined in strange ways Mm-hmm. So many strange ways. Yeah. What what happened when John joined the band? Did it did the the whole like dynamic of the band change? Uh, yeah. Finalized. Yeah. Yeah. No, it did. Um. Yeah. I think, I think it was a thing where like, our our previous drummer would kind of do it for fun, but he he really just was like, I don't want to go past this point. And I think one of the last straws. And he was a great guy. We were friends. Still get along. One of the last draws for me was just being like, I wanted to write a part in seven. It was just in like seven, four, or whatever. And I'm like, I just want to try this little different thing. And he was just like, no, like he just didn't want to learn it. So I don't know. Amber said a lot of, I think, really insightful things too about a lot of the vibe changes we had as soon as John joined, but it just was such a better personality fit. I see what we should take on that, Amber. <laughs> oh, um, my dog was being loud, so I was being quiet. Um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, John John was supposed to just play for one show, I think, one or two shows yeah. uh, originally. And we played the Ska TV. That was the first one that we played. He was filling in. And I, after the show, I was like, Rainy, I like him. We should keep him. Yeah. <laughs> and plus he's, he's, Dave is just too tall. This is a band yeah. of people, And it's like final form. I like it better. That's why our first album was called No Sequoia, because when we put it out, we had gotten John as a drummer and we were like, okay, no more tall people. (laughs) Wow. Wow. I like that. Wow. That's an interesting way to come up with an album title. (laughs) uh, When I talked to you guys before, I tried to ask you about this. so I'm going to try again. I wanted to know about the band's songwriting process and how it has progressed from the beginning to now. And when I asked this before, Amber said it had to do with drinking tequila and eating popcorn. Oh, yeah. Um, Our songwriting process might be a little bit different from most people's. I think uh, everyone wants the cut and dry answer of like, this person writes a song and this person writes this part. But sometimes like I'll write a bass part and sometimes Rainy will write a guitar part. And sometimes we'll collaborate on a song or sometimes one of us will come in more with an idea. Um, Yeah. And even though I'm not writing any of the like the melodies or riffs or whatever, sometimes we'll like be presented the song and be like, what if we do this thing here this way or something like that? Yeah, John. Just like construct help. Yeah. No, just John adds a lot of structural support. Yeah. <laughs> um, people, people don't really understand always the difference between songwriting and arranging. Mm-hmm. So does John take a bigger role in the arranging of the songs? I wanna know, I don't know if it's like a bigger role, but like I my my say is always welcome um and you know yeah i don't i i think that we've been asked this question before and i think we honestly just tend to give a terrible answer to it because there's not an easy answer to it like Mm -hmm. amber said there's been times where she'll come in with um something and she's like i have literally no idea what to do with this and Mm -hmm. i'm like oh i have an idea and vice versa but it's usually like one little riff and one little vocal part and we'll start smashing them together and john has had the type of suggestion he'll come in with is like um one really good example is the beginning of our song Matahari he was like we should have like everything drop out and I should just have like a little drum part for like eight measures here where it's just drums before I drop out again you I'm like okay and I at first I didn't like it just because it was new and different and I was like I don't know we have this intro already done but like now that's such a huge part of that song because Mm -hmm. I'm able to like just shut up for a second and click all my pedals and actually get ready for the next part. Mm-hmm. So like he'll come up with these ideas that change the way that like things can move. And Amber does the same too. I mean, I think, yeah. I think we all do. And I think um, when, when I first joined the band, you know, I was first learning all of the songs and a lot of like the newer stuff I was presented with were kind of stuff that you already like had. So I was like, all right, so like, 
I didn't feel as comfortable like saying, you know, like, what to do yeah. or something because like they were kind of already ideas that were working up in your mind. And but now as we're encroaching mm -hmm. on like really completely new material, that's kind of shaping up that way. Was there already a set in place when you joined the band, John, or did you did you guys change your set? Um, we. We, I mean, we had been playing shows, so like we certainly had like a number of songs that were ready to be played live and things. But yeah, I think they a few of them. I don't. I don't, honestly don't remember how many of the songs we like changed existing parts, but I'm sure there was some. And then mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't think we dumped any songs. We started adding a lot pretty quickly, and I don't remember if there were any we just like yeah. got rid of completely. Honestly, mm. there might have been something, but I can't remember. I think the hardest thing for for John's transition into the band, which he's really like excelled at so much recently, is like he, you know, he'd played a little bit of drums before, but it was very kind of fast stuff where you just kind of like had to get through each part successfully. It's like, all right, I got through it, I got through it. And then he joined Sapling and like, you're gonna play a pop beat for five minutes straight. Don't fuck up. <laughs> so, so he had to well, really yeah. like get steadier. And mm -hmm. I'm a drummer, so too, I'll start to notice if he's like getting tired or something. I'm like, <laughs> what's happening you need some coffee like, yeah <laughs> well i don't know if you guys were joking or not when you said you listen to a lot of new metal so maybe that could add something to do with it i don't know i uh, love new metal it's <laughs> great deftones um we i kind of touched on this a little before was it a plan all along to have this wall of sound i mean you guys use a lot of pedals and sounds to enhance the music it was noticeable to me when you appeared on that local music now show. And then I watched uh, a clip from Ralph's um, that along with Amber bringing the abstract art aspect into it. Did you guys know you had this whole thing together here or did, did, it, did it happen by accident? Um, take that. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always been kind of like a weird outside the box person, I guess. And it, kind of a related story when I first met Rainey she saw like all my on my art studio and all my art supplies and was like you just like go for it and make a mess and her stuff is all organized and really nice and she commented like sometimes I'm afraid to use all of my colors because I want them to stay nice and perfect in the thing and in the in their box and I'm like I'm the total mm -hmm. opposite of that she is so organized and on top of stuff and I admire that so much but I just absolutely come in with chaos. And I think I definitely encourage that a little bit. Uh, see Rainey's pedal collection. Mm -hmm. I definitely encourage the noise a little bit, but Rainey is always weird too. She wants to like make things go backwards and John's just as creative. He's he's brave for being a new drummer and joining mm -hmm. uh, a band with us, I think. <laughs> he's really brave. Hell um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Yeah. I don't think we planned it. It's just kind of what happens sometimes. Just what comes out. Organically, just once you got together, it yeah. all came together, basically. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I would just add to that that I think, at least for me, since I'm the spreadsheet person, mm -hmm. um, I think that, yeah, Amber definitely like kind of came into my life and like uh, showed me how to break my crayons confidently. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I just need to like loosen up with certain things. But I think that for me, I am I am a chaotic, messy person artistically, but I kind of like maybe have a little bit of like a meta viewpoint on that where I kind of think about structuring my chaos. So I'll, like just back to the kind of songwriting process thing with this, you know, Amber tends to come in with more like ambient noisy dirgy stuff and i have to put some sort of structure around it so i'm always like all right we need like sections here we need to decide cues and when things are going to change and i come in with this pop bullshit sometimes and i'll say amber i hate this riff that i wrote it's too like cute what do we do and then she just destroys it and puts it back together mm -hmm. and i let her keep some of the dissonance and then i make her play like in the same key as me for other things and um <laughs> so it's i don't know if you're at all familiar with uh, like discordianism and uh like actual heiress worship um as came up with our newest song but in discordianism this sort of like parody religion that i absolutely am obsessed with um there's the idea of the hodge and the podge and it's kind of like chaos and order balancing each other but also both not existing and also being the same thing it's just like this whole convoluted unexplainable thing and i always think about like amber i forget which one of us is the hodge and which one of us is the podge i think amber's the hodge and i'm the podge but like <laughs> we sort of 
we, we sort of balance out each other's different. It works. Things. It yeah. works. I, I love how you guys um, make what to me are like short films to accompany many of your songs. It seemed to be a plan from the start, like Stoop Kid. That was pretty much the beginning. That, that was pretty much the beginning of this version of the band in terms of presenting it to the public. Fantastic video. Talk about that for a second, because I watched that a few times. And Amber, was this like a... <laughs> I don't know how to ask this question. Was it's this fun. like a personal thing for you where you where it seems like you're playing a guarded person and you're oh. guarding your territory or your stoop? Mm -hmm. So definitely. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the popular 90s Nickelodeon show, Hey Arnold, but it definitely is uh, any anybody who knows it knows Stoop Kid, who's afraid to leave his stoop. Um, it's kind of a a song about becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy and a part of your environment, but it's, it's kind of combating that and taking the step off of the stoop off of this like predestined thing that you're supposed to be and just leaving that behind. If that makes sense. It does. I'm not familiar with the show, but that's pretty much what I got out of it when I watched it. I um, really liked it. Um, now, did you guys come up with the whole, did you come up with the whole, um, I was going to say, I guess it is a screenplay, mm -hmm. <laughs> script. Did you come up with the whole script for that? And then we'll talk about some of the other videos, but it's all your plan? Or did you have an outside person? No outside. We don't do outside people no. usually. <laughs> <laughs> so you that did... was mostly Amber. I think Stoop Kid was just Amber kind of had her plan and we were like, all right, cool. I, I yeah, remember getting a little... With... The I came in with notes in written on a bar napkin that were completely disorganized. And mm -hmm. I can tell like every, that's just how I operate. And I was like, okay, now you go over here and now we're going to do this. And everybody's just like, what the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of, okay, again, thankful for the spreadsheets. <clears throat> and then you got some of your friends to help you guys. Cause there are a few other people in your videos. Yeah, we had some mm -hmm. strangers in that one, too, that we just like, we mm -hmm. wanted kids. I remember we wanted kids in that video. We were really trying to get a bunch of little kids like playing ball with us outside. So we were walking around the neighborhood and we found like a whole huge group of kids with like one neighborhood mom with them. And I speak Spanish, which was helpful. So I went and I asked her, I'm like, hey, we're not creeps. Can we borrow your children for a minute? Like, do they want to like play ball in a music video? And I forget what happened. I mm -hmm. think they said, yeah, sure. And then they just like didn't come over. <laughs> I think we got ghosted. two of them, two of them came but over. They were and, older though. Yeah. I think they were like older, like teens uh -huh. or something, which was fine. So there's these two guys that we yeah. put in the video. <laughs> we did try to get like a horde of little kids running around though. It didn't quite happen. We also walked around the neighborhood with a field recorder and like, just got like sounds of just like the natural city yeah. noise, like cars driving by and like machinery. Our, some of our friends went to the basketball courts. Um, they were already just there playing basketball, so we recorded them playing. Just the audio like of them, the like dribbling ball. and shooting. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was fun. Fantastic. Um, you released your first album in uh, February 2020, which is, wasn't that far along after that. But you didn't know at that time that the mm. whole world was going to be put on hold. Oh, no, so. we knew. No, just kidding. <laughs> no. You knew yeah. That's amazing. Um, Awful timing what what how did that i mean it must have been really just a horrible feeling you put a record out and then all of a sudden everything just shuts down stack of cds <laughs> we still have some cds left if anyone wants to i want them. one yeah i will send you i will send you a, whatever you like mm -hmm. um well i guess so for me so we put out no yeah we put out no sequoia in february and then we had release shows on february 22nd and 23rd and i actually only remember those dates because well the, made, making the posters but also um that was a leap year and we were trying to pick a date for our release and linnea's garden was releasing a record no sorry power slut was releasing a record on the 29th still linnea <laughs> yeah still linnea um and i went to the the release show and it was like crazy fun and everything but I said, oh, shit, I don't want to release it on the same day as Power Slot. We were friends with them. I'm fr friends with Linnea. And I certainly didn't make it earlier to, like, steal Spotlight. I, I, we could have gone into March. But on my birthday's in February. I wanted it in February. So I was like, okay, well, their release is the 29th. We'll just get it out of the way with the weekend before. And I'm so happy we did that because otherwise it would have been even closer mm -hmm. to the shutdown and everything. 
um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's not like we weren't like going to go on a tour or something. We're not like a band that's like, all right, we're going to go do the things you do. We just put out our CD and we had our release shows, thank God. And, you know, um, I don't know. I, when everything happened, obviously, we all had to kind of adapt and we did the Apocalypse musical with some remote and some old recordings. And then eventually we were in person, but mm -hmm. it was kind of bad when John was joking, like, oh, we knew the world was going to shut down. I had joked, like, after we did No Sequoia, it was such a project for us. Like, just there were so many work moving parts. I was like, our next record, we should just record it in the basement and like do it all totally DIY and just pretend we're in a bunker at the end of the world and there's been an apocalypse and we're going to release this record. And then I, then it like mm -hmm. COVID came and I was like, oh, I, oh, I, I should not joke. What a visionary. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, in the same vein, the bitch shifter, uh, great song, wonderful video. Okay. Musk, Bezos, Branson, Zuckerberg, Framingham, Eco Lodge. <laughs> What's going on here, man? How do who, how do you come up with this? In the Framingham Eco Lodge, I mean. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start. I'll start off with that one because Bit Shifter, Bit Shifter was definitely a little bit more of like a rainy jam musically getting it started. But then the video, um, I I wanted to make a video and I was thinking about like, yeah, what are we gonna do? And usually, what happens, and I think this is true of, of especially both me and Amber, we'll just have like one random idea spark something and we just run with it, and then we really don't have the whole plan fleshed out until the day before we record if even then with bit shifter this is actually was very covid related i was driving down the road in sterling massachusetts where i used to live and on the radio it was talking about how like a lot of the bi billionaires like uh profits had only gone up during covid because like <laughs> they were still making all this money through like whatever the fuck and i was so mad i was so fucking mad i think i actually just pulled over and like just mm -hmm. screamed into my steering wheel for a second or something and i was just like oh my god like how do we live in this reality and then i started to have this idea where i was like you know i want to like have these like sort of disconcerting creepy masks and that i thought of the masks and then i thought of like what if we put these billionaires in like some shitty motel somewhere and just kind of show what goes on behind closed doors or like they don't know how to party or something. And we didn't really have like a single cohesive plan for it, but I was like, they don't know how to like be normal people. So we basically just like made a shopping list of all this random crap we wanted for it and props and things. And then it just, we basically just got a bunch of footage, which is kind of our MO. And we, we did have like a little bit of a storyline, like with Zuckerberg, the pizza guy showing up. We had a little bit of a plan, but around that narrative, it was just chaos. Mm -hmm. How I did you? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think the I was just going to say, I think the people at the uh, Connell Lodge that we filmed that at thought we were making a really weird porno. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No matter how much you specify it's not a porno, they think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't some guy ask? Well, yes. What are you guys doing here? Are, we, are you guys the people from last week? <laughs> and we're like, no. I was like, we're making a music video. And I, and I highlighted, I said music video. And he goes, oh, a porno? And I'm like, no. <laughs> They're all like high fiving John. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. I, that I tried. I, I had no idea. Are... I'm sorry. I had no idea Framingham was, they were, the pornos were being made in hotels. And that, and you know what? It was literally, I think we only picked Framingham because Amber and I lived in Central Mass and John lived in Boston. So that was really it. We just, yeah. I mean, we middle. looked for a couple. I think that was just like the most efficient one. Yeah. I think we tried to find one with a pool, but we couldn't kind of glad we didn't oh yeah. my god i don't know there was some idea with a pool amber was like we gotta have a pool and i'm like we can't uh, afford this place has a pool prices on our band fund so <laughs> i don't know i don't remember what her plan was but i'm kind of glad that we weren't like filming in a, in a pool <laughs> if you're listening or watching on youtube this is a must see video mm. i mean it's Okay, I did. Uh, for some reason, my notes aren't all in front of me. And I'm not going to pause and go in the other room. But there was another video you did, and there was a bunch of people in it from the Boston music scene. Yeah, everything and was better. Everything is better. Okay, how did you do? I mean, that was during the pandemic, obviously. What did you do? Like, send the, the song out to all these people and say, "Can you do a little part?" We lit the beacon, and they came. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, hi, Mr. Pickles. Pickles. <laughs> um, 
I made a spreadsheet is how we did that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we I wanted to do a video. That was the video we made, I believe, after Stoop Kids. So it was no fuck this yuppie barbecue was pre COVID. Yeah, yeah. Fuck this yuppie barbecue was pre COVID. Just kidding. And then everything was better was our COVID project where we were like, what if like we used everything was better to talk about like, you know, pre pandemic, whatever, and um, just had everybody do whatever they want and submit footage for it. So yeah, we put out like, I think I emailed people who had like pledged to our like, Kickstarter or whatever for no Sequoia and then just like put up something on Facebook. And um, what I did was like, take the verses from the songs and kind of break them up into chunks so there was like basically every line was a chunk and i just had everybody record like two pieces and i would use the one that i like better and i, I don't know just put them in order basically so it was fantastic really all it was. thanks mm -hmm. <laughs> um was jj gonson helping you guys early on because didn't you place some once shows yeah yeah, we played one shows. We love JJ. Um, she we released the video for Everything Was Better actually on the like once Zoom. Um, yeah, JJ JJ is yeah. a good friend of ours, and also I would say too huge shout out to JJ. The the best thing I think she's ever half inadvertently done for us was hook us up with the Stone Church in Brattleboro, Vermont. If you are anywhere near Brattleboro, this place is awesome. Mm -hmm. They have great shows. Everyone that works there is amazing. And um, we wanted to play there. And I think on Instagram, she knows the owner, Robin, and she tagged him like, hey, do you have anything for these guys? So he's like, well, let me see. The specific date we were trying to play that area, there was a Talking Heads tribute act, like a national tri tribute band, um, Start Making Sense. And he showed us to them and they were like, hell yes, this is what we want. So now we're friends with that band. We've played other shows with them. They just asked us to play like a date in the fall. They're amazing. Also, if you like the talking heads, nicest, absolute mm. nicest people on earth. Very talented. Very too. talented. I know a lot of people call you guys experimental punk, but there's also the art rock thing that's definitely mm. part of this whole. Obviously, because we, you know, you became friends with Mission of Burma, and they were always like part of the art rock thing. You know, they brought two scenes together. Um, Amor Fati, did I say yes. it right? Amor Fati, yes. Came out in 2023. Um, I, 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 you know, a fox upon a tomb, the line, I have an IUD and a gun. Please talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. What did I say? That? Um, yeah, that uh, lyric. So that whole song is not, again, cohesively written about one thing exactly, but it is definitely broadly like, don't tell me what to do. And like, um, also this idea of like, you know, a fox is kind of like what, like a sexy person or whatever. And you're just sort of like dancing on somebody's grave in the end, like, hey man, fuck you. Like you said all this, these things about me of how you wanted to control my life. Um, but yeah, that lyric, um, I, I got an IUD in April of 2022. And like, again, I forget exactly the timeline of like row being overturned, but I, a lot of these things kind of were confluing, confluencing. They happened at the same <laughs> time in my life. And I was just like, how are they saying, oh, the next thing they're going to come for is like birth control and IUDs. And um, meanwhile, we're having like all this gun violence and no one wants to really regulate that enough that it's going to make a fucking difference. So I was just like, oh, I guess these things are, are equal, right? Like I have an IUD and a gun, like I have two weapons, so you better fucking watch out. Um, but it was just coming from a place of like having to really yell about stuff. And when I, when I brought that intro <laughs> to John, to put the drums together, I felt so self conscious and exposed about like, okay, so we're gonna start this song with me yelling and a drum part and it felt so awkward mm -hmm. to piece it together. But I think now it's like people really Yeah, they expect it. Yeah, they stop and are like, Whoa, what's that? Mm -hmm. so. I know I'm personally affected by everything that happened in the last since 2016. Um, and, you know, I can't even really watch the news anymore. Uh, are you guys very reactive to everything that's coming, going on in the world? And does it come into your music? Like, obviously, this did, but does that happen a lot? I mean, certainly for me, I was kind of curious how Amber, Amber, the person who doesn't own a phone, would, would answer that first. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a bit of a caveman, and I'm still using a hammer and chisel over here. But uh, 
you're better. Off. I think it's this, it, that's true for, for everyone really. You write about your experiences and you try to make sense of the world around you or make it not make sense or make it tolerable. You just have to get out whatever's coming in. Um, so you don't drive and you don't have a cell phone? <laughs> no, I, I have my license. Like I can drive. I just, I don't have a car. Yeah, we, we, we plan. We, we, make, we make it work. We make it work. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bum. <laughs> I'm pretty much a bum. No, I think you're intelligent, actually, because I wish I could take my cell phone and throw it out the window. But, you know, I'm glued to it now. That you know, it's just. You. Mm-hmm. Wait, let us get the field recorder before you throw your phone out the window. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, a, I guess I, to the question about, like, the news and everything, I I definitely exist in this space where I'm, like, really trying not to pay attention, but I also can't not pay attention in a certain sense. And so usually, honestly, what happens, I think, is the way it makes its way into our music is, like, one thing really pisses me off, like, the billionaire thing that set off BitShifter, and then I just kind of, like, roll with it from there, and there's usually some, like, free writing and incorporating other topics, and it just sparks something. So I usually don't, at least for me, I, I don't know about Amber necessarily, but like, I don't sit down and say, I am going to write a song about this. Um, nine times out of 10, it's like, I have some pissed off line about something, and then there's a bass part involved, and then I start playing with it phonetically and rhythmically. But yeah, I think, you know, everything that's going on <laughs> definitely plays a role. Our cat so, uh, just over speaking of phones, I wanted to show off my new landline phone. It's a hamburger. <laughs> yes. Wow. Unrelated to anything, but yeah, this is my phone. You we can watch call Bob's me at home, every except day. you can't because I'm not giving anyone my phone number. <laughs> wow. <laughs> twisted, you know, twisted, you know, as my people started calling me twisted Rico, but this is a twisted band. I love mm-hmm. you guys. Man. I really do. Um, I also wanted to bring up the D- Dana Cauley played on um, Snake Charmer. How did that all come together? Did Dana see you guys play or did you just reach out? I don't know where my cat is, but he'd be really jealous because there's a cat in the video right now. Uh-huh. I don't know where Cam is. Camden, Maine is the name of my cat. He's a rescue and that's his name. Camden, yes. Maine. Came mm-hmm. from the streets of Dorchester. Nice. And uh, who's what's your cat's name? Because I love cats. This is Grace. She's purring really, really, really loudly right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, she's deaf, which definitely plays a role in her just screaming sometimes and not knowing that like there's other noises happening in the room. So <laughs> yeah. she just walked over and looked at us. And if you're only listening to the audio, you won't get this. But she just went. <laughs> so she just did this silent, silent meow with her mouth open. Um, I yeah. love dogs too, by the way, Amber. I don't want your dog to get upset. I, I'm, I'm an equal, I'm an equal opportunity employee. Here comes Cam. Cam just came walking in the room, like, "What's going on in there?" He was very, very upset. She's yeah. pouting right now. <laughs> well, she's actually pouting because my partner is on vacation, so she's a little doggy depressed at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, Snake charmer. Yeah, yeah. Dana so- Colley. Yeah, so Dana, like, Dana is, um, I know him just kind of peripherally from music things. Like, we don't, like, you know, hang out and get coffee. We're not, like, tight like that or anything. We just, I think we're just, like, friends on, you know, like, Facebook and Instagram and stuff. And um, periodically we end up talking about wind instruments or something somehow. And um, so I had been looking for a bass clarinet, like, for myself. I've always, like, really wanted a bass clarinet, and I just was obsessed with this idea some point I brought this up to him asking about like, do you have any kind of insider tips of like, is anyone selling one? The, I don't know. And he said, I have no idea, but I have an alto clarinet that I haven't used in forever. So if you want it to borrow or kind of indefinitely just take it, I was like, okay, great. <laughs> so that's how I got my alto clarinet. But through this process, whenever we got to the point of recording Snake Charmer, one of us, I don't know, I honestly don't even know if it was me or not, but I was like, we should get Dana Colley to play Barry Sachs on that song. And I just reached out to him. I mean, he's for hire. He's, you know, does a lot of studio stuff. Yeah. So it, we just, you know, we hired him to do it. And um, we actually, it was funny because we'd specifically asked him to play Barry Sachs. But by the time we got the recording from him, it was bass clarinet with all these effects on it. And for a moment, I was like, oh man, we wanted saxophone. 
But then we were like, no, this is perfect like mm-hmm. he knew what he was doing and to be honest i've never even asked him like was that like an accident because he and i talked about clarinet so much in the interim or was he just like fuck you guys i'm doing clarinet i have no idea but it sounded amazing <laughs> <laughs> i love dana collie yeah. he, he was on my show and i asked him about the night album and he started talking about the art on the wall behind me you don't yeah. want to talk about the record and it <laughs> went on for like a whole minute and then all of a sudden i'm like we don't have to talk about that. He goes, okay, <laughs> I will talk about it. He, he's a cool guy. I really like him. That's um, my favorite Morphine record. And, and it's, I, I I got into them. So like, you know, with our ages, like I, I didn't know anything about the band or Mark or anything when I first started listening to them. And I didn't even realize for a little while, years and years ago, that like that record was posthumous. I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize it came out after like Mark passed away. Um, I actually, the first time I met Dana in person was at, um, the dive bar in Worcester. I actually, I'm curious, Amber, if you were working there at this point, this was years ago though. And I didn't know Amber yet then. And my friend Duncan Arsenal, who was playing with Dana introduced us. And um, I was asking him about the cover of the night. And he was telling me about how it's this like flower that only opens every like whatever number of years at night and their friend had taken the photo, I think. So I don't, I don't remember all the details, but that's there's a lot of what you were asking him about, too. Yeah, there was a lot of controversy surrounding that record. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, um, I, I mentioned this quote to you guys before. I have to read it again because I just like it. Most bands that fall into the noise punk category, are either pure noise and aggression or electronic near dance music sapling exist in both worlds being both punk and groovy dance music. Plus their songs feel both silly and completely serious at the same time, which is never a bad thing. If it's too loud is the name of the publication. Is that a fair description? Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> Amber's making a good face. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was one of my favorite, uh, one of our favorite reviews. That's Ken from If It's Too Loud. His blog is awesome. If you don't know it, check it out. Um, my one of my other favorite ones, I forget who said this, uh, the Feel Weird Album of the Year. Yeah. That was Justin Perilli. He called uh, it the yeah. Feel Weird Album of the Year and a fairy tale trash mysticism fuzzscape. And mm-hmm. I was like, can I put that on the website? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a great quote. Wow. Yeah, All you guys the- are weird. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, though, uh, we have to thank our friend Jerry from Starlight in Southbridge for what has to be, no, one of the two greatest pieces of live feedback we've ever got, which like sapling, what a rockadelic freak, what a psych, what an artful freakish rockadelic psychic show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck that means, Mm. but thank you. (laughs) A shout out to Southbridge, Massachusetts. I didn't think that would ever happen, but. Starlight is one of our favorite venues mm-hmm. it's venues. weird there's an art scene in southbridge yep. and they re- they made it they they reopened after covid and just got a better sound system stepped it I up can dig it mm-hmm. um before i talk about eris worship did i say it right yeah eris 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 i watched the video of you guys doing i'm sorry you feel that way at ralph's total like babes in toyland feel on that one that performance was fantastic it was just experimental noise at its very best i'm sorry i can't come up with quotes as good as those other guys but i'm trying um is that like your when you play at ralph's i mean is that like a home base kind of gig for you guys Mm, no everyone (laughs) said no (laughs) everybody loves ralph's but i mean yeah where do we go with this answer? Yeah. Where do we go with this? Amber? <laughs> We've played there a lot. We have played there a lot. That's a statement that's factual. Um, um, <clears throat> we've played places like Starlight more than Ralph's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's talk we about Starlight there. instead. <laughs> Maybe once a year or so. Yeah, let's let's talk about Starlight. I was just talking about the performance because I love when <laughs> Amber painted John and then disappeared. I don't know where she went. She yeah. was out of the video for a moment. She was painting people in the audience, which is always consensual, by the way. Wow. She does wait until they like say yes, okay. And a lot of it is people who know what's coming. So two things. Um, I forget who took that video. I think it was our friend Ramona, but um, she didn't turn the phone or the camera so we don't actually see that amber is painting everybody else which made me laugh a little bit because it's like oh my god like we knew what was happening but on the video you can't see the other thing was that our dear friend pete pillow man pete camarado who put on the show 
saw Amber start to walk off the <laughs> stage and ran out of the room because he knew what was coming. <laughs> and as soon as the song ended, and he came back in. I said, Pete, did you just run the fuck out of the room? Like, what did you think was going to happen? He's like, no, I paid my dues. I've gotten painted on before. <laughs> but like he didn't he thought she was just going to go at him, which I guess with Pete, maybe you would have. We know Pete well enough, but. <laughs> yeah, I try. I try to present. It's so loud, so I can't be like, "Hey, can I paint on you?" Because that that sucks. But I, you know, creep at people, and if they go no, then I don't paint on them. But again, sometimes I feel like people are a little bit, uh, maybe shy. To yeah, say they don't that. know like what to. Yeah, they don't really know what to make of it. Usually, I pick somebody that knows what's going to happen and I know is cool with it, and I paint on them and then progress through the audience so they see what's going to happen. Yeah, and we'd also like to note that it is tempera paint and not oil paint, and we are not bioterrorists that are trying to kill you. <laughs> what kind of paint is it? It's uh, it's like kids' finger paint. It washes off really easily. Um, I had it used, used to be paint acrylic. Before. It used to be acrylic um, because that's just what I had been given or what was cheap at the art store. But tempera paint is really easy to remove. I also just got a batch of biodegradable glitter from Culture Hustle. They sent me like 70 bucks worth of their products, which is awesome. Um, they make bio biodegradable glitter. So if you get too close to the theremin, I can, you know, shower you with biodegradable glitter now and no one can bitch about me killing the planet. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. our security system, so you're going to get glittered if you're too close. I love all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, so the new single just came out. It's been a month now. Uh, can you talk about the song and the video, especially the concept, Beats? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what to say about the beats. I, I mean, you, you'll have to tell me about the beats because I can't. I don't know what to say. Let's tell you about beats. Um, First of all, these blast beats are they blast these, beats. are they blasted in house? <laughs> these ones are. I stole John's joke. Um, um, yeah. So if anybody has read the book Jitterbug Perfume by Tom Robbins, that's really just where all the beat references came from. Like I have the patch on my shirt that says Deadly Serious, which I think you see really, really briefly if if I even got that into the final cut, but um. In the book, basically, uh, all these there people are trying to find the last ingredient for this perfume that would like grant in more immortality, basically. So there's conversations, number one, about like immortality versus like, would you even want that? And also these different, I don't know what the word is for someone who makes perfume. Do you know, Amber? Like a perfume. Oh, uh, I don't know. Perfumist? I feel, like, mm -hmm. I feel like there's a word, but I don't know. And I bet it's French, but um. At any rate, all these different people are competing to find this ingredient. Spoiler alert, not really a spoiler. It's beet powder from the outside of beets. So there's a lot of talk about beets in the book. And I just got it in my head after we had the song written that what I wanted to lean into for imagery in the video was jitterbug perfume and then the myth of Eris, Eris, the goddess of strife and discord, who inspired Discordia with the Hodge and the Podge, but she throws the golden apple onto the table, you know, and causes this whole kerfuffle that leads to the Trojan War. Um, so that's why we have Amber with the golden beat. We use the golden beat for the golden apple. And the song, that one was one that lyrically I brought in and was like, um, talking about kind of examining my own like thought process of being like kind of really drawn to like chaotic, chaotic, chaotic people and chaotic situations that are maybe not so good for you, but also like you would prefer to deal with the chaos than not have it around. So Eris worship, you know, the goddess of chaos and sort of, there's a lot of lines in the song where I'm asking myself, like, what's wrong with me? Like, um, must be a lunatic. Is this a sickness or sin? Stuff like that. And um, yeah, and as always, like Amber came through. I don't know, at, what, at one point we decided we wanted to make her a news anchor and presenting the news. She pulled it off. <laughs> yeah, oh, actually, when you asked us about the news getting to us, that was the point of that was like, yeah. this news anchor, you know, we're worshiping the news and watching the news, but really like it's not doing you any good. So um, the king of bad news being the opening line. So Amber just took that character and rolled with it. And I think she has something to clarify too about uh, references that everyone seems to keep thinking. Oh, We've had three um... people be like, we love the Anchorman references. I really, uh, I don't know where the Anchorman thing comes from. Um, 
I there most of the references are to Tom Robbins books, uh, Still Life with Woodpecker and Jitterbug Perfume. I so. mean, the I know you we said like the like Don Mahogany sounds like Ron Burgundy, so I get that. But yeah. I, oh, that, like, yeah. I, I understand that. Like, it's, yeah. Though. Yeah. it's not Ron Burgundy. But it was just funny because a few people said that to me and I was like, oh, and Amber did the whole intro sequence. Like, I didn't even see that until it was edited. So that's what we do a lot is I'm like, you do your part. I'll do my part later and we'll just smash them together. But um, like the rest of the video was definitely all of us. But I edited the final stuff and then um. Yeah, people were like, I love the Anchorman references. And I'm like, maybe I missed something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I, love, I love how this band is a collaborative effort from all of you. It's fantastic. I wanted to ask you about Mission of Burma because I met you guys formally um, at the Mini Beast show in Lowell. And um, Mission of Burma guys talk about you guys a lot. They like you. How did yeah, that all, how did yes, that love affair start? Um. So Mission of Burma was one of my absolute, well, I shouldn't even say was, like still is, but really when I was in like early, actually early college, this was after they reformed, my boyfriend at the time was a huge Mission of Burma fan. And of course, like, you know, we're younger, we didn't get to see them the first time around. But um, I can't remember if I told the story previously, but like, um, I was on the phone with him at one point. I was at UMass. This was like 2004. And I said, oh, I just saw in like the campus newspaper that Burma band you like is coming. He goes, hang up, get tickets. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I hung up, I got tickets. And um, they opened for um, Pixies. And I was like, I wow. was the Pixies. Yeah, I was like, yeah, Pixies are cool. It was their kind of like reunion tour or something. And um, once I saw Mission of Burma play, I I couldn't tell you a single thing that happened during the Pixie set. I was just like, what was that? Mm -hmm. And it changed my life. So I when um, On Off On came out, well, On Off On was already out because it came out pre Obliterati. But once I bought Great the album. CD, yeah, once I bought the CD, at least I listened to that CD at a certain point every single day, all the way through walking around UMass. Like it was probably unhealthy. <laughs> um, and anyway, yeah, years down the road, when we were in service or before I was in service, I saw service play with Mini Beast. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like Pete's doing a totally different role. But like, yeah, over time, like, I don't know, at some point, um, I approached Pete and started chatting with him and we all like became friends. They played our release show for, it was for no, no Amor Fati. was it Amor Fati? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Okay. That was later. Yeah. They, they played our Amor Fati release show. Um, and Roger, yeah, Roger, I didn't really like know in person or we didn't know in person until a little bit later. Um, but at some point he heard us and really appreciated, yeah, the artsiness of it. So he came to see us at a show we played in Greenfield massachusetts which was really cool for me and he gave you know, us like, a really honest yeah. uh, review that we are his uh second favorite live act to see yeah. which i think that that means more oh yeah yeah we <laughs> local I, like live act. i but. teased him about it immediately i'm like oh we're your second favorite local band he immediately was like well, well well okay this other band i've seen a lot of times and i've only seen you the once so far and i'm like no no no, no. i like that a lot actually because don't 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 blow smoke right um, <laughs> it means more so then i contacted the other band immediately Landowner, and I was like, oh, it seems like we got to collaborate. Like, we should be band friends. <laughs> I can't remember if this was in the interview or after, but he mentioned you guys to me when he was on my show. I can't remember if it was in the interview or not. You know and what? then I was, I was like, you know, I've been seeing that band, a hearing about that band a lot lately. And then I got more into you guys. And that's when I realized I need to get them on the show. Well, thanks. Um, I really, really dig you guys. Like, you guys are fantastic. Um, I know uh, this show will probably be out be just before the Iron Horse show on, in Northampton on June 29th. But you have a bunch of other shows coming up. You want to plug any of those shows? Yeah, we. Um, I mean, I would say the best thing is just to go to our website and just saplingband.com. And, you know, and there's a shows page there because what you can do, there's like a little widget thing and you can like subscribe to get emails. I don't know what it is. Um, we don't have anything in July, so we have... June 29th at the Iron Horse, and then we have a handful in August yeah. at um, Notch. Not well, so first is Somerville Warehouse 13 on the 3rd, uh, Notch on the, no, and then it's News Cafe in Pawtucket on the 8th, mm. and then we're playing uh, Notch Brewing on the 13th with with uh i know it's dwelly and that, i don't know who else yet but... um oh do we not have not anyone yet, else yeah. yet okay. I, they might and then haven't told us i don't know yeah. i like notch 
Yeah, I've good never. I've yeah, I've been there a few times to see shows, and it's good. Um, they have like, I, I was they have like kind of three different areas to play. Like there's like an, the inside, which I imagine we won't be unless it's like pouring. But there's a whole big outside patio that's cool. Um, Amber will ask them if they have whiskey, and they probably don't because it's a brewery, and then she'll be mad. Yeah, I don't say so Amber, but don't worry. It's I used to live around there. I know where all of the liquor stores are. <laughs> I think there's paint stores near there too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So. I don't know that. I'm just kidding. No idea. I usually have some paint in the clown box, so I'm pretty covered. Yeah. The clown what's the, box. What's in the clown box today, Amber? Oh, I'm afraid to open the clown box, actually. Um, it was talking this morning and it scared the dog. <laughs> Sometimes. Wow. Well, um, hey, uh, you guys are fantastic. And uh, fantastic. thank you so much. <laughs> um, people out there don't know, but now they'll know now. I flubbed the first time we did the interview up and screwed up the audio. So we did it again. And these guys were nice enough to say no problem. And doing an interview at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning is admirable mm, at the very yeah. least. We are always awake at at least seven. And then this morning, John and I woke up at 830 because um, he turned his alarm off last night because he didn't have to get up and water the garden because it rained a bunch. Yeah. So I woke up thinking it's seven o'clock and I roll over. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I get up and I'm like pulling my T-shirt on. I'm like, oh, my God, I got to like paint my eyes open so we can go do this. Actually, the alarm did go off at 720 and then I just like turned it off. I was like, nope. <laughs> This is the timekeeper of the band. <laughs> we don't need time on the weekend. Well, we're going. We don't need time. Hey, I love you guys. Good luck. <laughs> you know, thanks for doing this. And uh, I, I can't wait to see you live, actually. I feel I feel de I feel like I need to see the band live, and I don't know why I haven't yet, but I will. That way yeah. too, man. What gives? I will be I will be at a show. I can guarantee you that. Um Thank you. Thank you so much. Really?